Hello and welcome back to another edition of Mets Musings, and I'm joined this week by Mr. Ben Fadden. He is the host of the uh, Talking Friars podcast, a San Diego Padres uh, podcast, and he is here with me. And Ben, welcome to Mets Musings. Thank you so much, Gary. Thanks for having me. Uh, ben, we're still in a little bit of shock here from last season when the uh, Padres came in and uh, beat our Mets in the playoffs here. And uh, I guess you guys were in a little bit of shock uh, to get as far as you got last year, were, were you? <laughs> yes, yes. I think Padres fans were. Uh, the Mets series was great. Um, I, I was going in thinking they could win game one. Because Scherzer, he does give up home runs. If they're aggressive, they can win that game. Wasn't expecting to win the DeGrom game. They did. They didn't, obviously. Uh, thought they were going to win game three with Musgrove on the mound. They did that. Uh, obviously, a lot happened there with Buck Showalter and all that. Um, but yeah, the Dodgers series was really, really surprising. Um, I thought the Padres could win it but they were playing a team that they hadn't had success off of in the regular season in the Dodgers. And so you're kind of going into that series as a Padres fan thinking, well, they haven't proven it. So why should I expect them to go beat the Dodgers? So yeah, it was right. a surprise, but it was something that I thought that they could do if they played well and they definitely played well. And, uh, seem like most of the key players are playing really well at that time. And that's all that matters. Uh, the regular mm -hmm. season, you just throw it out the window and yeah, made it to the NLCS. And if a couple more move, if a couple moves didn't happen or, you know, Bob Melvin made a couple different moves instead of the ones he made, maybe they end up winning the NLCS too. Uh, but it was a successful year. They made progress and now it's world series or bust for us. Yeah. And, and yeah, it, it was a tough thing that NLCS because the Phillies was so red hot as well yeah. that it was just a clash of, of t two teams really that came out of nowhere, even though the, the Padres, I think people were looking at more because of the signings that they had made. Uh, and, 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 that, you know, with, and some of the young plays that they had, but really the Phillies really were the team that came out of nowhere and uh but like you said uh you know the dodgers won 111 games last year and, and the padres dispatched to them uh and and just it's almost like they ran out of gas or or whatever you want to call it i don't want to say luck it, it, and let's be honest there is a lot of luck in, in the playoffs too i mean uh but uh it's just uh you know, it ran out for them, but uh, a terrific year all in all, I think you'd have to consider. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I thought last year for the Padres, I was going to consider that year a success if they get past the wild card series because I thought they had the talent to do so. And then if they were able to be competitive with the Dodgers, I was not expecting the Padres to beat the Dodgers. Again, I thought they could. But if they were competitive, I think that's progress because in the regular season, there were games, or at least if you look at the season series record, they weren't competitive really. Um, I think they won like four or five games all year long. It was really lopsided, but yeah. they were competitive and they weren't just that. They won and they were competitive in some of the games against the Phillies too. And they definitely didn't sit still in the the winter months as uh, they made another big signing and uh, they they continue to keep signing people. <laughs> they just signed Cronworth to uh, uh, what a seven year deal, and uh, of course Tatis had been signed to a deal. He'll be back soon. We'll talk about him in a little bit. Uh, but they tied up Machado as well. Uh, for I don't know how many years, uh, um, and uh, you're really spending the money uh, to make an effort to keep this team on top. And and as you said, now now they got to the NLCS this year. It's the World Series, and there are a lot of people that are picking them 
even to win the Western Division over the Dodgers. Uh, everybody seems to feel the Dodgers are weakened by the loss of uh, the key players. The shortstop, they they uh, uh, lost Lux, and of course they lost Turner this past season to free agency. And so, is is there more pressure on the Padres this year? And uh, uh, how, what's the feeling in San Diego? Is it definitely that they have to win this year? That, that's my expectation. Yeah, I think that's a lot of fans' uh, expectations as well. I think there's going to be some fans, like if they make it to the World Series, they're going to say, well, that was a successful year. We haven't made it there since 1998. I wasn't alive then. Um, so I could definitely understand that viewpoint. But for me, they made it to the NLCS. Progress would be winning the NL pennant. But when you're in the World Series, if you don't win it, you got to be disappointed. So that's why I'm like, yeah, it's World Series or bust. You're right there and you don't win it. Then, yeah, you're going to be that, – that's going to end, end up being disappointing. So, yeah. And with the NOS, like the Padres, they should be the favorite over the Dodgers. I know the Dodgers, they've definitely took it to the Padres a lot. But the Dodgers got worse and the Padres got better. They're getting Tatis back. They brought in Sander Bogarts. They kept a lot of the important pitching staff uh, p- pitchers on uh, the roster. Nick Martinez, Robert Suarez. Uh, they brought in Michael Walker. They brought in Seth Lugo, obviously from the Mets. So right. they're a better team than the Dodgers, and they beat the Dodgers. And the Dodgers just got worse. No great. I don't think they have a great shortstop situation. Obviously, they lost a five-win player in Trey Turner. The Padres, they're gaining two superstars with Bogarts and Tatis. Um, so, yeah, I, th- I think, the, yeah, the pressure is on the Padres, but pressure is a privilege, and they've, they put themselves in this spot to have the pressure on them with the spending and Peter Seidler, A.J. Preller, showing the fan base that they really do care about trying to field a winning team, and they're not just viewing it as a business, you know. I love right. Steve Cohen and Peter Seidler, what they're doing, continuing to spend and be like, we have the money. If we lose money, okay, we'll gain that back at some point. I'm trying to win here. This is what it's about. It's not just about getting millions of dollars in profit and sucking and not having people come to the game. Like we want this to be a winner. We, we're a fan of this team, not just a business person of this team. Cause those are definitely right. two different things. Uh, right. You can care about the business. Like Steve Cohen's smart. Peter Sadler's smart, but they're actually showing that they care. And I think that goes a long way. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Tatis. We talked about him before a little bit and Bogarts. Is there, do you think there'll be any friction in that they brought in Bogarts? Uh, I'm not, you know, there's a big trend in baseball now to have people play out of position or uh, diverse themselves, the different positions and, uh, I don't know if it's always good because it could hurt your defense in the long run. Look at Miami, what they're doing. They put Chisholm out in center field now. I know you're a West Coast guy, but <laughs> we just saw Miami, so it just it sticks in my mind that they've got the all of these guys out of position. Um, you've got Machado, who's a shortstop, playing third, but he's played third. Uh, now Tatis is going out to right field, and and they're probably doing it the right way. I mean, uh, he probably had time when he was uh, rehabbing and everything to, to go learn right field. But do you ever worry about that there's too many guys out of position? And sometimes in the name of offense, we we uh, a, a team will hurt the defense. I think that the Padres defense could be hurt at the beginning when Fernando's just coming back. But you look at Machado, he's a third baseman. I know he he started as a shortstop, but in the big leagues, he has played at th- third base. I think he's yeah. the, the best third baseman in baseball. Xander Bogarts, he is a shortstop, and he's at shortstop. So there's nothing changing there. They're going to be comfortable there. Hassan Kim, he has played second base before. Jake Cronenworth will play some games at second base, so it's not like he's only playing first base. And at first base, he has played first base before. It's not a totally new position to him tatis and right field 
that's not totally new to him either. I know he's a shortstop, but do you want your best team? Do you want the best talent out there or do you want a lesser team? Like I have the viewpoint of Tatis, he's a very athletic guy. He's versatile. He'll be able to figure out this outfield stuff. And we've already seen some really good plays that he's made defensively in right field. He's showing off his arm. So I'm not worried too much about Tatis and right. Trent Grisham in center field, multiple gold gloves. He's one of the best defensive center fielders in the game. Soto to left, he's going to struggle out there, but he was going to struggle out in right field as well because he's just not a great defensive outfielder. So I don't view the defense as that big of a deal, actually, as maybe some others might because they're seeing Tatis, he's a shortstop. Oh, he's in the outfield. What the heck's going on there? Juan Soto, he's a right fielder. Why is he in left? What the heck's going on there? That's not going to be good. But Soto's defense, as a Padres fan, like we already know, it's not going to be that great. You just have to hope that his bat will, you know, uh, outperform or, you know, make up for the defense. And Tatis, he'll figure it out. Um, We're already seeing positive signs there. And I view it as a AJ Preller. He's just constructing the best lineup that he can on paper and having Bogarts in here. If that means switching guys positions, that brings, that makes the the best lineup for the Padres and look Bogarts. He's one of the best players in the league right now in, in these like six games. So it's starting off pretty well. Well, talking about starting off both of our teams are not doing good so far, as we record this, when I say they're not doing good, I mean, they've, they've just been around the 500 mark. San Diego was at three and three. As we record this, uh, the Mets are three and four. Canceled their opening day today because of rain, and the sun is out right now. But, you know, that it is what it is. Uh, but um, uh Guys are still struggling up and down the lineup. Soto, I see you still struggling a little bit uh, for the Padres. Uh, Bogart is off to a terrific start for you guys. Um, uh, who Who's hot right now other than Bogart? Who's carrying this team, if anybody? And uh, uh, who have you been disappointed in? So, for, again, Bogart has been earning his money so far. Uh, but uh, is there anybody that uh, it's so early in the season, but is there anybody that's been a disappointment so far? Yeah. So disappointment wise, I mean, Soto is on there. I think Manny's kind of gotten off to a little bit of a slow start. Jake Cronworth, the first couple games didn't get a hit, but when it's the first couple games, you see the zero batting average and you just like freak out. Yeah. When it's been a couple <laughs> games. So the, <laughs> It's you know it's hard for me to sit here and be like, oh well yeah right. these guys are these guys are sucking. Well, it's been you know three, four games. Um, right. They're gonna turn it around. Jay Cronenworth, he just had I think a three hit game the other day, so he's already starting to turn it around. Uh, Trent Grisham, in terms of like surprising, pleasant surprise, uh, he is playing well offensively, defensively. Uh, he already has multiple home runs so far this year. And he's changed, uh, I guess, I don't want to say his swing. His, his swing hasn't changed, but his posture. His posture is taller at the plate, and he, it seems like he's more aggressive. He struck out so much last year, and that's not going to happen again this year. I think this is a guy that could go hit at least 20 home runs for the Padres this year, uh, and he's going to be hitting eighth, ninth in the order when Tatis comes back. But he's gotten some leadoff games. Uh, and then he's sitting in the bottom of the order when he's not leading off. So I like what I'm seeing out of Trent Grisham so far. I'm not totally surprised by it, but, you know, you don't really expect the 8-9 guy, if you're a casual fan, to have a really good start. Uh, but that's what I've seen so far from him. And then Bogart's obviously off to a good start. Catching situation, I mean, we're going to get what we can get out of Austin Nola. It's not going to be a whole lot of power. He's not going to throw a lot of guys out, but he commands defensively. He can command the, you know, the pitching staff. Mm-hmm. Um, ha Sung Kim, he did hit that walk-off home run the other night, but it's him and Matt Carpenter kind of that are going to get some playing time, share playing time, because Carpenter, if a tough righty's on the mound, Carpenter will be in the lineup, and he will probably play first, 
Cronenworth can go play second. Nelson Cruz can be the DH. So we just haven't seen Hassan Kim, I don't think, that consistently yet to get a big, uh, obviously not a big sample size, but to get a good opinion on what he's going to do this year. I expect a better year out of him. But, yeah, I, just, I know that's a long answer. But, yeah, Trent Grisham's definitely mm-hmm. someone that stands out to me uh, so far. Bogarts and then Manny Soto, Cronenworth, definitely not worried about them. They're going to turn it around. Well, I'll tell you, I'm glad to see that that uh, Jerickson Profar is gone from there because yeah. he killed us in the playoffs. I mean, he was just a, a thorn in our side in the playoffs. I'm glad he's gone. Uh, but uh, you signed uh, Roughnet Odor as well is with the team, and uh, he's been playing. He's been playing some second base as well. How how do they figure out this mix of guys? Uh, when they're putting him out there. Yeah, so most of it's based on matchups. There's some times where it's not just based off of left, right, and it's based off of, oh, does this guy hit low pitches better, and this is a guy that likes throwing low pitches, so maybe they do it that way. But with mm-hmm. Odor, usually he's hitting when right-handers are on the mound, and then if he's not playing second base, then it's right field, and it's either between him or David Dahl. And Odor kind of has more pop uh, than David Dahl. It feels like Bob Melvin's going to go with the hot hand there. And David Dahl's been swinging the bat pretty well um, in the couple games that we've seen him at the plate. So I, w- I would, to answer that, I'd say matchup wise, that's how they're going to figure out the playing time. But when you have two lefties and Dahl and Odor, it, it, you got to kind of just go with the hot hand because one of those guys probably isn't going to be with the team when Tatis comes back. Mm-hmm. So just get as much as you can out of the hot guy uh, as you can right now. And the guy that's not hot might get sent down or he'll stay. Maybe, maybe they'll have Dahl stay because he has more outfield experience and then Odor goes to the minor leagues or he opts out. Uh, Because I think he can do that because he's a vet. Um, But yeah, it's a lot of it's matchups, and maybe it's just instead of right left, it could be how does this one guy fare against this opposing pitcher? Now let's talk a little bit about Tatis. He's coming back after missing, uh, it seems like what uh, almost two years, a year and a half, or something like that. Yeah, Uh, had. injuries uh got in a motorcycle accident i believe it was hurt his wrist uh then had resurgery on the wrist uh, then he got suspended for uh of uh, the uh what was the drug policy for lack of a better of a term uh terrific talent but now he's coming back in a new position why why did they pick right field over you would think usually if because he was a shortstop, they might move him to second base, uh, but they moved him to the outfield. Any particular reason he has a terrific arm, I guess that played into it. But any reason there why the outfield over another infield spot? Yeah, so I think a lot of it is the roster construction. They have a lot of infielders, uh, Hassan Kim, Jake Cronenworth. They were going to bring in infielders anyway. And the outfield situation wasn't great. This Profar was going to leave. And Tatis had played some outfield. It lessens the chance of him probably subluxating the shoulder again, even though he had surgery. But before he had the surgeries, they had him go play the outfield to lessen the chances of that. Um, And the arm, obviously, put him in right field. Mm -hmm. That means you can put Soto in left, who is not as good of a defensive player. Uh, so I think it helps in multiple ways. It allows Bogarts to be on the roster to play short, which improves their lineup. It allows Hassan Kim, who's great defensively at shortstop, to just move over to second base. Jake Cronenworth can go to first. They have a lot of infield versatility, and they just didn't have a whole lot of star outfielders. They just don't. So they had to they had to move Tatis to the outfield. That, that just seemed like the best uh decision for them just based on the roster construction and what is the attitude towards tatis uh uh 
in in the uh, in the city as well as uh, in the clubhouse is there any ill feelings towards him because of the um the the nature of the injury i mean he, he got in them you know they they warn they're almost like warned sometimes not to ride on motorcycles and things like that and yet he did that got injured um any hard feelings towards him at all um Right when the suspension happened, yes, there definitely was. I, I have not worn my Tatis jersey since that happened, <laughs> but I, I'm I, I definitely forgave him, uh, and I probably will wear that again at Petco. Um, it was a dumb decision. The motorcycle thing was dumb. I think uh, obviously that was an accident. Um, the Clostable thing was dumb, and I think he's hiding it. He tried to hide it by saying ringworm. Uh, when he was just trying to get back faster uh, from the the wrist, the shoulder stuff. So, yeah, they were dumb decisions, disappointment. But now I think most of the fan base is just super excited that this guy can be back uh, in the brown and gold. Like, we're going to remember it. It's one of those what ifs. What if Tatis was healthy? What if they went to the World Series? Because we know he's a game-changing talent. Uh, but he can't do anything about it now. And it, I think it just hurts mm -hmm. Tatis for Padres fans to be negative about him when, because we know every other fan base, probably including yours is going to be negative towards Tatis when he comes into town. So the, I think Padres fans, we got to be uh, his big support um, backing system, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. because he's going to get a lot of hate. And so, yeah, to answer that, they, they've, they, I think most of the fan base has forgave him. We're not going to forget. Maybe we'll forget if he wins a World Series because um, <laughs> we've never, we've never had one, right? So uh, <laughs> I, I think we're just ready. We're ready for the return, and we're definitely going to root root him on when he comes back. <laughs> and and the bullpen. Any major changes in the bullpen that uh, everybody's always looking to build up their bullpen and. Uh, you know, Mets are no exception. Padres are no exception. Uh, what was done to build that up over the offseason? Yeah, so obviously bringing back Robert Suarez, he's hurt right now, uh, dealing with uh, some shoulder, I, I believe shoulder issues, maybe some dead arm, uh, but he'll be back. They still have Hayter, still have Garcia, still have Tim Hill. Uh, Drew Pomerantz, we thought he was going to be ready for the start of the season, but he's not going to be. I don't think we can really trust him, but in terms of additions, Brent Honeywell, uh, Domingo Tapia, they are on the roster right now and might be on the roster for the Met series. I think Honeywell will don't know about Tapia Tapia. He was facing mostly like double a guys in spring training and performed mm -hmm. really well and made the roster because of the Robert Suarez injury. Um, but yeah, so Chris Matt's still on the roster. The bullpen, it's pretty much the same. You're going to be seeing a lot of the same names that you saw the wild card series or saw last year. Um, Honeywell's really the main name, and obviously it was a big prospect with the Tampa Bay Rays. And then injuries happened. He had four surgeries, then went with, went to the A's. Uh, didn't I don't think he got to the big league level. Then pitched well in spring training. He definitely has the strikeout stuff, and he's kind of like the long man for the Padres. And in the rotation right now, it's Darvish, Snell, uh, Lugo, Waka, and uh, who am I forgetting? Ryan Weathers. There's one. I think I'm forgetting one other guy. Snell, Darvish, Lugo, Weathers, Waka. I think I'm forgetting one other guy. Anyway, that's the rotation. Uh, the, the bullpen is pretty much the same same group of guys. And and uh, you mentioned Tata, and he after he came over from Milwaukee, he struggled quite a bit out there. How was the, how was his spring, and how has he looked so far this season? Yeah, so Hater, I mean, I think the struggles are behind him. He, he could have some bad outings this this season, but it was really mechanical issues with Hater uh, last season, and. He started off really well with Milwaukee last year, like didn't give up a run in the first month of the season. Typical Josh Hader. And then he struggled, got traded mm. to the Padres, struggled a lot more, was taken out of the closer role temporarily. He had to deal with mechanical issues. I think part of it was the landing spot and 
kind of being just moving towards the plate instead of not directly towards the plate. I know that sounds simple, but his his delivery is it, it's unique. So he had to mm-hmm. just get the mechanics back. And then right. he pitched the best we've ever probably seen him in the postseason. And yeah, it sucked that he did not pitch in the NLCS in Philadelphia. They definitely could have used him. Uh, but yeah, I, I love what I'm seeing out of Josh Hader. There hasn't been any struggles yet uh, that I've seen so far this year. So everything's good with him. You mentioned our old friend Seth Lugo, uh, and now a Padre. The Mets let him walk. Uh, he was a relief pitcher here with the Mets. Started as a, he began his career as a starter, moved to the bullpen. Uh, he's back in a starting role and had a terrific game uh, in his first start, I believe. Um, tell me about Seth Lugo. How does he look? How does he feel? You know, he does have or he still, unless it's healed, that partial tear in his. Uh, 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 UCL or the, uh, you know, in the elbow there. And they were afraid he might need Tommy John surgery, but it, that thing's held up for the last, I don't know, five years or something. Uh, any concern about his health? Obviously he passed a uh, uh, medical to, uh, to sign. So uh, talk a little bit about Seth Lugo. Yeah. Um, you know, Nick Martinez was the other starter. They was just blanking on. So it's just, just, <laughs> just to, say that um so yeah lugo i'm not worried about the injury stuff i'm more worried about can he do this consistently in the rotation all year long not doing it in years uh but at that first start i mean the velocity's there the velocity was there in spring training and uh that first start first pitch strikes 22 out of his 25 at bats uh i think were first pitch strikes and there were fastballs breaking balls Obviously, he has an amazing breaking ball, uh, the curveball, right? So I was impressed by what I saw from Lugo. And obviously, it was a really – I think it was like a two-hour and three-minute game the Padres played with Lugo on the mound. So, yeah, really fast. He had to adjust a little bit, obviously, like everyone else, to the pitch clock. But I really like what I'm seeing so far. It's one start, so I don't want to overreact to it and say that, you know, Mm -hmm. Seth Lugo is going to be an ace for the Padres. But I know – I went into this season – Right after the Padres signed him, I was like, this guy, if he's not in the rotation, he's going to help in the bullpen. The Mets relied on him with him and Diaz, right? right. Those were the two really right. guys that Buck Showalter trusted in the postseason in that wild card series. So he's going to impact this team positively one way or the other. I just question on if it's going to be in the rotation the entire year, especially when Musgrove's coming back and if everyone's healthy, then either Nick Martinez or Seth Lugo is probably going to get kicked out of the rotation to go to the bullpen, but that will only help the bullpen. So. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, if he's healthy and can last a year, he probably can get you 12 to 15 wins. I mean, if, if he's pitching well and he's healthy, that was the big argument here. He couldn't go like back to back days and I couldn't understand when they did have some pitching needs, why they didn't stretch him out again and move him to a starter. But I guess they felt that they needed him more in the bullpen and the short bursts of uh, throwing were better than, you know, pitching five innings in a game or six innings or whatever. Um, But because there were times when the Mets needed starters and really could have could have pressed him into service and yet they would determine to keep him in the bullpen so uh right. look sometimes it works i mean they've had guys uh uh ali perez who was uh you know he, he wanted to be a starter we had a couple of good years here and the mets kept wanting to put him in a bullpen after some injuries he refused to uh, then he ended up playing another 10 years because guess what he went into the bullpen you know, and, and did, did a good job. So um, I, I guess it's just to who the coach is and, and who can convince you. But um, uh, you've also got two other studs out there and you Darvish and, and uh, Blake Snell, they're still uh, out there pitching. Well, uh, talk a little bit about them. 
yeah, I think I think the Mets might miss Blake Snell because uh, he's uh, maybe they won't, but he's he's starting today uh, as we record this against the Braves. Really good pitching matchup tonight, by the way. I think Spencer Strider and Blake Snell, but yeah, Snell mm-hmm. first start this year. Uh, it was it was a Blake Snell start. He had seventy pitches through three innings, wasn't allowing a lot of runs, uh, but got out a lot of jams. Um, had nine strikeouts on the night but didn't get through five innings. Some nights he's going to go seven and strike out 11 and be like that second half Blake Snell. And some nights he's going to walk a million people. He didn't walk that many people (laughs) in the first start. He was just throwing a lot of pitches and he was allowing base runners and he was getting out of innings, but he just didn't provide much length. So we'll see what happens there. uh, If Snell does face the Mets and Darvish made his first start, um, yesterday in the day game before the Padres headed to Atlanta and he it was weird his spring training was weird because he wasn't with the team he was in Japan preparing for the World Baseball Classic and I think the Padres thought that Darvish was going to get more innings for Team Japan and he only threw 93 pitches in the entire World Baseball Classic oh boy yeah so you can see how the Padres would be frustrated with that and mm-hmm. so it took him a little bit longer to ramp up. So he didn't start opening day or the second game of the season. He started the sixth game of the season. But I'm not worried about Darvish long term. Like he's a veteran. He works his butt off. Um, he, he's a workhorse. So I'm not worried about him. But it just stunk that he wasn't ready to begin the season, uh, you know, first, second game. Um, but yeah, Darvish signed him to an extension. He continues to find ways to get better, whether that's new pitches. He has like 20 pitches that he throws. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's what it feels like. So, um, yeah, Nola ha- Austin Nola, the Padres catcher, has a lot to work with uh, when Darvish is pitching, although the pitch comm device should help. But, um, yeah, I'm not worried about Darvish. He's uh, If there's someone that I want pitching in the postseason starting a game, other than Joe Musgrove on this Padres team, it's probably you, Darvish. So I believe we were going to see you, Darvish, uh, when you guys come to town uh, Monday. Uh, so uh, never like to see him. <laughs> yeah, you'll see He's him. Either... You'll probably see who Lugo, I would think. Or is, no, Lugo. I don't think Lugo. so. Lugo, uh, according to the the uh, preliminary pitching here, is pitching, I think, Sunday. Okay. So you'll see uh, yeah. Ryan, you'll probably see Ryan Weathers that first game. If they, if they don't move Darvish up one, there'll be Weathers and then Darvish. And then probably Nick Martinez, I would think the, or Blake Snell mate. Yeah. You might get Snell. Yeah. Probably be Snell because I think uh, Martinez is scheduled for tomorrow night. Yeah. Or tomorrow afternoon or whatever. And then Walker and, uh, Lugo. So we won't see our old friend Seth Lugo, but uh, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, that might be a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Ben, I, I see by the clock we're running out of time. So I want to thank you for taking the time today. And I know it's early out there yet, but uh, thanks a lot for taking some time and talking uh, some Padres uh, baseball with us. Of course. Anytime. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, and uh, give us a little plug about your your uh, your podcast and and whatever else yes. you're doing. Yeah, so podcast, YouTube show, Talking Friars about the Padres and San Diego sports. That's on YouTube, on podcast platforms, and then on social media, Twitter, Instagram, at Talking Friars for highlights and stuff. And then I also started a just general Major League Baseball YouTube channel. Uh, called Baseball Struck with highlights and commentary. So you can check that out. That's on YouTube. Um, so, yeah, that's that's what I got going. Okay. And thanks again for taking the time to come on. And I'll be right back after this. Baseball and BBQ, your place for interesting baseball talk, opinions, and history. Baseball and BBQ, your place for barbecue recipes, tips, and interviews from the world of barbecue. If you like baseball and if you like barbecue, then tune in to Baseball and BBQ. 
Find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and BaseballTalkRadio.com. Did you know that Baseball PhD can be heard on BaseballTalkRadio.com? Our shows rotate with other top baseball podcasts. Now don't forget, that's BaseballTalkRadio.com. With us, we'll help you get a PhD in life through baseball. With BaseballTalkRadio.com, you'll hear the rest of the excellent universe of baseball podcasts. Hello, baseball fans. You're listening to Baseball Talk Radio, the home of great baseball talk shows. At BaseballTalkRadio.com, you're going to find great shows like this one with the great Gary Mack and the Mets Musings Podcast. And now back to the show. And we're back, and I hope you enjoyed that interview with Ben Fadden of Talking Friars, a San Diego Padres podcast, and the Padres come into town Monday the 10th, the 11th, and the 12th of April. So go and check it out. That'll conclude the first homestand of the season. And other Mets news, Bryce Montes de Oca, who was diagnosed with a stress reaction in his right elbow midway through spring training, underwent Tommy John surgery. How did we go from loose objects to Tommy John? Well, they went in, they removed the big bone spur and some loose fragments, and when they tested the the, uh, 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 UCL in there, it was determined that they should just go ahead and perform Tommy John surgery, and so they did. And he will be out until next year sometime. So he's going to miss all this year and parts of next year. And uh, so uh, speedy recovery goes out to Bryce Montes de Oca. Uh, Jose Quintana has been with the club off and on. And he is coming along. Says he feels a lot better since his surgery. Uh, to remove a lesion from his uh, rib cage, so uh, he's on the mend, but we won't see him for a while. Omar Navarez just went down with a uh, calf strain. He will be put on the IL, and uh, recovery time is about eight to nine weeks. They're looking at with him. Now, that's not official, but that's uh, usually what was. Uh, it was reported, and that's usually what these things take to get over. So that means that uh, we will be seeing a certain 21-year-old catcher from Syracuse, and more on that when we go down on the farm. The Mets announced also that the K Corner, which will operate in the former McFadden's location on Seaver Way, will be open on opening day for the Mets home opener. The fans will be able to enjoy food and beverages at the K Corner before, during, and after all Mets homes games this season. The K Corner is a nod to Section 44 at Chase Stadium, which became known as the K Corner during Doc Gooden's starts as fans would display K signs for the number of strikeouts that Gooden recorded in a game. There will be an exclusive entrance to City Field through the K Corner for those with game tickets for convenient access to the game. Game tickets will not be required to enter the K Corner. So go check that out. Uh, new food at City Field. The two most spectacular how do I even eat these dishes are from Jacob's Pickles and Sunday Donuts. Pickles, which debuted last year at City Field, will have a new fried chicken sandwich at its booth. But this isn't your run-of-the-mill fried chicken sandwich. The buns are two glazed donuts with a hefty smattering of honey barbecue sauce. I'm getting hungry just reading it. And if that's not enough, try this from a dessert from Sunday Donuts. A milkshake topped with a glazed donut and sprinkles topped again with popcorn. You can also swap out the popcorn for Oreo crumbles. Sounds delicious. Something to wash down the chicken sandwich with. And aside from great food 
at uh, City Field. We're going to have a giant video board, a brand new scoreboard out in center field. And uh, that's going to be the biggest in baseball. So go check that out when you get your tickets and go to the ballpark. And now it's time to go... Down on a farm. Okay. Well, as you know, the minor leagues have not started yet except for AAA Syracuse. They've gotten off to a little bit of a slow start, but our boys are hitting well. Ronnie Mauricio keeps his hot hitting going. Mark Vientos has been very hot. Brett Batty was hitting the stuffings out of the ball before he went down with a right thumb inflammation. He got good news on that. Had an MRI. There's no structural damage. He is day to day. Francisco Alvarez is leaving Syracuse and is joining the team uh, because of Omar Navarez landing on the IL. So, the catching duo will be Nito and Alvarez. So probably um, I would guess they would work in Alvarez slowly and uh, Nito would get the bulk of the catching, but you never know. They could just decide to uh, uh, throw the kid into the fire. He, he played a little bit last year and uh, had a bad ankle or so. Um, Hopefully he's healthy and will do a good job this time, and maybe he'll be able to stick or at least give them, you know, uh, the thought process to keep him up here all year. But we'll see what happens with that as the time goes by. But Francisco Alvarez joined the club and uh, will be here for opening day for the home opener. And he hit a homer the other night as well as Ronnie Mauricio, as uh, I said, he continues to hit and play a good shortstop. The other teams, Binghamton is opening on April 6th, uh, weather permitting, and uh, the uh, Cyclones are opening up on April 7th, as is the St. Lucie Mets. So should be an interesting minor league teams this year. The Cyclones look like they're... Got a lot of the Mets prospects there. Alex Ramirez is there. Uh, the second line prospects. Uh, Tidwell is there. Uh, who, who's the other guy I'm trying to think of that's there that's exciting and you want to go see? Um, can't think of it right off the bat. But Oh, Parada. Parada is there. The catcher that they're very, very high on. So, um Brooklyn might have an exciting team, and a lot of these guys came from St. Lucie last year, and, and St. Lucie, of course, won the Florida State League Championship. So uh, manager Chris Newell, Newell is going to have an interesting uh, season there, and Binghamton is getting a lot of the uh, or number of the Cyclone players that were actually uh, in the playoffs last year. So... Uh, you know, hopefully there's some stars that come out of these uh, two classes. And uh, guys, as I said, we're watching is going to be uh, Ramirez for one, Paredes another one, and uh, some of the guys at uh, uh, Double A, uh, uh, JT Schwartz. Um, we're going to keep an eye on some of those guys and see. And, of course, AAA with Maurizio and Vientos, who also has been off to a good start, uh, and uh, Brett Batty until he gets healthy and back in the lineup. So that's our minor league report. And, actually, that's going to wrap it up for this week's show. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Ben Fadden, and I hope you will consider going to the – uh, YouTube page and hitting the like and the subscribe button. It helps us uh, keep track of uh, who who is, uh, you know, subscribing and uh, it helps you know when a new episode of Mets Musings is coming out as well as the audio. Uh, we were on Anchor. It is now 
Spotify, Spotify for podcasts, has taken over Anchor. So uh, you'll get us on uh, Spotify, but you can still reach us at anchor.fm. Uh, I think that's still a viable link. Uh, so you can check it out there or just get us on any podcast uh, player that you have, any app, podcast app. We're on virtually all of them, I think. So uh, as I, we're on Amazon, we're on uh uh, Spotify, Apple, Google Play, you name it, we're there. So go check that out as well. And again, check out the video version on YouTube and hit that like and subscribe button. And so uh, that's it. The Padres come into town after the Marlins. The three-game set with the Marlins over the weekend and then a three-game set with the San Diego Padres and the Mets hit the West Coast then for a very early West Coast swing. Um, really, never remember it being this early, this early in the season going, but they're going to go out to play Oakland, LA, and the Giants. And hopefully, we're working on getting some guests on from uh, Oakland and. Uh, San Francisco, we'll see how that goes, but uh, we'll break down that if we can. And until next time, remember to keep the faith, stay optimistic, and let's go Mets. And I'll see you the next time on another edition of Mets Musings. <laughs>